welcome uh, to the live stream of our Sunday morning worship service here at King City Bible Church. I'm Pastor Jim, and uh, I just want to thank you for uh, joining us here today, uh, praying that the Lord will speak to you uh, through His Holy Word today, that that Word will bring you uh, closer uh, into a richer and a deeper relationship with Him. Don't we all want a closer walk? I pray that that would be the case uh, for us this day, that we would receive much encouragement and hope uh, from His mighty Word uh, for our hearts today. Uh, we, uh, uh, a member of our church family went home to be with the Lord uh, last week uh, and uh, found that out uh, last uh, Sunday afternoon that uh, Jean Walsh had uh, passed and now uh, she is with the Lord. Uh, we had a, a memorial service uh, for her uh, yesterday as a family. And uh, I, I want to say, as I was thinking upon that, if God uh, gives you the opportunity to give a, a word of hope, a word of encouragement, a word of comfort to someone who's grieving, uh, who's struggling, Take that opportunity and trust uh, that the Spirit uh, of God will give you uh, the words to speak or the words not to speak, uh, but just trust Him uh, and, uh, and enter into that opportunity, that open door that the Lord gives you to do so. Uh, and I hope that we as uh, the family of, of God will be praying for Elmer uh, during this time. Uh, he needs your prayers and and support, and Jean was just so close uh, to her uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and uh, if you would just keep them all uh, in your prayers. Uh, I love the fact that, uh, that Ed uh, has just become one of the family. <laughs> it, just brings, it just brings a smile to my face uh, how much Ed has become a part of that family. And, uh, uh, as, just as he brings joy to us, uh, you know, he brings joy to, uh, to many, and uh, just grateful to see that. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, let's be prayerful this week uh, that there would be peace in our nation. Um, we, we need to come to the Lord uh, with that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, times around us are ever-changing, and as they do, uh, we just need to continue to keep our eyes uh, on the Lord and pray that we would do so, continue to do so, no matter the circumstances. Uh, this also is in terms of this virus that continues. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord and pray that many would be healed. I pray that uh, soon uh, the suffering and the grieving might, might be calm and might come to uh, a bit of an end, I would hope. But uh, no matter the case, uh, no matter what, but let's, let's be a people who continue to trust in the Lord. As such, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. I hope you'll join me. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for, uh, I can't, uh, the, the weather here is unexplainable, Lord, uh, but we uh, do thank you for this uh, unseasonably warm weather and pray that it would uh, be something that we can enjoy and uh, bring us a little happiness uh, in, these, uh, in these days. And uh, Lord, we uh, just thank you for your word. We thank you that it is truth absolute. And that, that is, we can trust in it. It is the word that stands no matter what. It is the word that does not change. And pray that uh, we would trust in the author of that word. Uh, help us to continue to place our eyes upon you, focusing on you and uh, not become so overwhelmed by the circumstances, by the disasters and calamities that surround us, although there are many. Lord, we pray for our brother in Christ. We pray for Elmer, uh, that you would be with him and provide him with much strength, uh, comfort, rest, peace, and guidance as he uh, goes on these days uh, without Jean by his side. He has been such a loving caretaker, such a uh, committed husband, uh, and uh, pray that, again, you would uh, bless him in these days, surround him with those who love him, and uh, let him know your love, your peace.
increase your joy in these days. I pray the same for the rest of Gene's family who just need the supernatural peace that's beyond understanding. It only comes from you. May you bring it and sweep it over this family during this time. Help them through the period of grieving and mourning, Lord, as only you can. We pray, Lord, for uh, this week uh, ahead, uh, again, Lord, that there would be peace in our, our nation, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, work in the hearts of those uh, who would be and seek to be disruptive, uh, disorderly, uh, violent, aggressive, Lord, that uh, there would be a great working in our hearts, uh, Lord, uh, as only you can. Um, a change of heart, a change of mind, that they might be able to express uh, their, their disagreements, uh, their disapprovals in another way uh, that would not bring uh, hurt and uh, pain uh, to others, Lord. Uh, I pray that we as uh, believers would continue to be a people who would do what is true, right, uh, noble, excellent, praiseworthy things in your sight, Lord, uh, and that it would uh, be an encouragement for others to do the same, Lord, to seek a life that would be pleasing to you. I, I pray these things, Lord, this morning in, in your name. I just, again, want to continue to pray for those who are suffering from uh, the loss of loved ones from this virus. Pray that uh, for those who are continuing to suffer uh, from this virus, whether it be mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all of the above, Lord, uh, it's, it's difficult upon those who are afflicted with it, upon those who are watching uh, their loved ones be afflicted. Help them, Lord. We pray for those who are serving them, uh, those uh, committed uh, care workers, Lord. Uh, be with them and strengthen them. Uh, help them to be safe and well as they administer care. And uh, we pray, Lord, that there would be a relief from this soon. Uh, but no matter if that's the case or not, uh, that we would keep our eyes on you. And so if it continues uh, long into this year, uh, help us to be a people who keep our eyes on you, uh, who continually trust in you and your sovereignty, your will, your purpose, your care. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, here we are again in uh, uh, Matthew uh, chapter 8 this morning. Uh, you might recall last week I, I had said that it was back in early October uh, that I had taken notes uh, from uh, on uh, Matthew chapter 8. And then I stopped. You know, I, I left it there. I didn't continue on. And, uh, you know to develop that into a message uh, to preach to you. Um, I abandoned those uh, for the sake of uh, some messages uh, from the Psalms uh, that I thought would be appropriate uh, during that time. So I'm trusting in the Lord's timing. I've taken those notes. I gave you part of that last week uh, and then spent the, this time developing uh, the further notes from that chapter into a message to deliver to you this morning. I'm trusting the Lord's timing on this, uh, that uh, this is the right time uh, to deliver this message from Matthew uh, chapter 8. And uh, knowing that, uh, that should bring us uh, some encouragement, uh, just knowing that alone. So, uh, Matthew chapter 8, uh, last week we were looking at the uh, beginning uh, chapters I'm sorry, excuse me, the beginning verses of this chapter, and we're going to uh, look at verses 23, uh, really 23 through 27, but I'm going to read through uh, 32. And in fact, I might begin my reading this morning back in verse 18. I want us to get this full context here of what's happening. So, Matthew chapter 8, uh, beginning our uh, reading in verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, and you'll remember that people had been coming to him, uh, you know, uh, with all their 
crises. You know, uh, they had seen the miracles that he had done, and they were coming out. Uh, in fact, we know that the village came out uh, seeking uh, to be healed, uh, for the spirits uh, to be driven from them. And so we read in verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around them, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. And then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me. And let the dead bury their own dead. And then, verse 23, he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. When he arrived uh, at the other side of the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men came from the tomb coming from the tomb, met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water, and we'll conclude our reading there for this morning, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading uh, of our word. Last Sunday morning, I was emphasizing uh, a, a bit in the beginning verses of this chapter that Jesus had authority in his words. He spoke a word, and things started to happen. And so we looked at that word of healing, that word of authority and power a bit last week. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4, reading from the Amplified, says, For the word of a king is authoritative and powerful, and who will say to him, what are you doing? And friends, that's really what, we're, what we were seeing last week in the message, the authority of and the power of God backing up the authority of the word of Christ. And in this chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 8, the context of the power of the word of Christ is the emphasis that's placed on man's adversity as being an opportunity for God to do something as his word goes forth in authority and in power. So throughout this chapter, we've already seen this last week, there are uh, crises of different kinds. You know, we see, we saw diseases and infirmities that doctors cannot cure. Remember last week, a man with leprosy, and that leprosy could have been any number of skin disorders, right? Uh, then, of course, the account of the servant of the Roman centurion lying paralyzed with intense and terrible, tormenting pain. But uh, we saw last week in the case of the centurion's servant how distance was not a barrier to Jesus' healing disease. You know, we see that he has power over disorders, he has power over medical conditions, but friends, he, we saw that he even has power and authority over distance. He has power and authority over time and space. And today in our text, we see a storm that no seaman could overcome. And we see these demoniacs, these demon-possessed men that no society could tame. 
right? So this King of Kings and Lord of Lords, this Son of God, the Savior and anointed Messiah who has been promised and is now at this entering into the world. He has authority and power over nature. He has authority and power over the demonic realm. He has power and authority over the natural and the supernatural. He is Lord of all, and when he speaks his word with the authority that God has given to him, all of heaven backs him up. Amen? You know, I, I believe that he is the same today as he has ever been. The God of heaven, he is the great I am. He's the way he's always been, and he's the way he will always be. He is the eternal, great I am, the one who was, is, and ever shall be. And his son, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so what we're seeing here in these accounts in this chapter, Matthew chapter 8 in particular, is that Jesus proved his sufficiency for every circumstance that life can throw at us. Friends, I want to encourage you today that Jesus is sufficient for everything that you face today. What, whatever you face today, Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is able. And so we read of this storm in Matthew chapter 8, again, verses 23 through 27. And it's a storm on the Sea of Galilee. And Galilee is situated uh, 700 feet below sea level. It's surrounded on uh, the west, the north, and the east by mountains that rise around them between uh, 3,000 to 4,000 feet above sea level, so that the whole relationship between the water, the atmosphere, the altitude, and the surrounding mountains, it causes an environment to produce storms uh, very suddenly. Uh, most of you are aware that my uh, wife, uh, Brenda, lived in Israel for a time. She only lived an hour and a half, maybe two hours from the Sea of Galilee. And uh, she said that on the north side there of the sea is Mount Ramon, which is the only snow-capped mountain there in Israel. So you can imagine the cold air blowing down the mountains funneling through the canyons of the hills there and across the lake. And of course, it's going to make turbulent waters in general uh, for those who would, be, uh, who would fish upon that sea. And then, of course, you have the hot air that's coming in from the area of the Dead Sea. And what you have is a collision of that hot air and the cold air, and uh, yeah, squall can arise really in a matter of minutes. Brenda never uh, got to see a, a storm for herself, but she was certainly aware of the conditions uh, that might cause these storms to erupt over uh, the, the lake. And this is what happened on that particular day. But it, it appears anyway that this storm that we read of was more severe than usual. The, the crew on this boat, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were hardened fishermen, and yet they appeared to be absolutely terrified with what's going on around them. And so perhaps it's the case that this was a bit of a satanic storm. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the text tells us that Jesus rebuked, if you look at it, he rebuked the wind and the waves. And the word uh, that's used for rebuke in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, is a word that Jesus used to rebuke demonic spirits. You know, Matthew chapter 17, if we were to go ahead a bit, Matthew chapter 17, verse 18, says Jesus rebuked, same word, Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Uh, it is the exact same word that Jesus used to rebuke the wind and the waves in Mark's uh, account of this event. And again, we see this event in the, in the other Gospels, Mark and Luke. But in Mark's account of this event, in Mark chapter 4, verse 39, 
Jesus speaks to the storm and says, quiet, be still, in Mark 4, 39. And that literal, that literal rendering is, be muzzled, be muzzled, be silent, be quiet, right? And he uses that term, he uses that word over demonic spirits as well. And so there's almost, or there seems to be a personality, as it were, behind what's going on in nature with this storm, possibly. Uh, now, you know, I, I would say if you look at the context of what's going on here in Matthew chapter 8, and the other Gospels for that matter, is that Jesus is on his way to deliver a man, or men, as we see here in Matthew, right, who are possessed, overrun, overwhelmed by demonic spirits, a man that society has given up on completely, you know, uh, we read from Mark's account, we know, throw, you know he's, he's thrown into a graveyard, left as a madman to run around, naked, cutting himself with stones, screaming and shrieking, and they had no answer for him. They had none. And, and Jesus is on his way to deliver what you, well, really, what you might say for Satan is just a, a, a man who, who was a trophy for him. Or men, as we see here in this account here. So bringing all of those factors together, looking at the context here, I, you know, I think that the enemy was really wanting to disrupt what Jesus was going to do. Now, of course, you know, he was constantly attempting to uh, disrupt uh, the service uh, of the Lord Jesus. And uh, I would say, by the way, that, you know, the, the devil hasn't gone away. You know, he's, he's still very much, uh, you know, uh, working and uh, alive and well here on planet Earth. And he'll do anything and he'll do everything. Uh, in his power to hinder you on your journey to come into repentance and faith in Jesus Christ if you have not yet done so. And he'll put every obstacle in your pathway. He wants to, you know, he wants to prevent you. He wants to blind your eyes from seeing the light of the gospel of Christ. You know, I don't know if you've experienced that. You know, that every time you make a tentative move toward Jesus, some storm arises, some crisis, some disaster, some calamity, and it causes you to just back off and just leave it a while. You know, friends, you, you know, we have to understand that at times, these are not just circumstances, that there can often possibly be a personality, an entity behind that, an enemy who wants to stop you from coming to Christ, who wants to stop you from experiencing all the deliverance and the freedom and the salvation that he brings. And maybe for some who are listening this morning, you can identify with that. You know, every time you move toward uh, God, it's, it's, it's like a hornet's nest is stirred up. You know, and I would say that this happened for those, uh, you know, listening this morning, many of you believers. You know, it happens in the lives of Christians, doesn't it? You know, it, 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 you know I would say particularly uh, in relation to people coming for prayer from deliverance from, well, you know, various problems. You know, for certain individuals, everything seems to be thrown in their path, preventing them from coming to him. Maybe that's been your experience. If you're in a storm, I want to encourage you not to be so conscious, so aware of the storm. Now, even if it's a satanic storm, which this may well have been, not to be devil conscious, because that's what Satan wants. He, you know, I, I would, he is powerful. Don't, don't misunderstand me. The enemy has power. Don't underestimate that. But he's not so powerful. 
Okay, he, he's not more powerful than the one whom we follow and serve and call our Lord and Savior. God is greater. So the enemy has power, yes. But he is not more powerful than our God. But I, I do want us to see this morning that Satan, he's into storms. In, in the sense that Satan is... I would think the enemy just enjoys light shows and sound shows, and he, and he likes to make you know a, a bit of a you know a, a show of it all, right? Huffing and puffing, right? All of that. He wants to blow himself up. He wants to exaggerate himself and his power, you know, to make us think that he's greater than God. That's his objective. He wants us to think that he's more powerful. He wants us to think and believe that our God is weak. And what helps him is whenever it appears that God is asleep on the job. Jesus was asleep on his boat and Satan wants us to think that God's forgotten us, right? You know, he, he wants us to doubt God's goodness. He wants us to doubt God's love toward us. And that's the reason why in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 8, it says the disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Now in Mark's account, the disciples say to Jesus, Mark chapter 4, the second part of verse 38. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Do you, do you see that? You know, here in Matthew, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. In Mark, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Right? That was the motivation, friends. Not only to, not, not only to save their own lives, but they were asking, Lord, how, how can you sleep through what we're going through? Don't you care? How can you, how can you sleep through this? But friends, the good news is that God is good. The good news is that God is good. And whatever, whatever, whatever huffing and, and puffing and blowing Satan is doing in whatever storms in our, of our lives, God is good. He's always been good. He is still good, and he will always be good, and he is in control, just as he has always been, just as he always will be. You know, but if, if you're going to enter into that blessing of, of God's goodness and God's providence in your life, you have to believe that he's good. You, you, you must believe. I have to believe that he is in control. Satan had been uh, permitted to, uh, I believe, interject momentarily with a storm. The disciples were just the disciples were, were just aghast, you know. But, but, but God wasn't taken by surprise. God wasn't taken by surprise. If you look at verse eighteen, I, I want us to see this. You know, I, I think. I think it'll open our eyes a little bit. Verse 18 of Matthew chapter 8, where we began our reading. So leading up to this event, verse 18 says, When Jesus saw the crowd around him, look what it says, friends. He gave orders. He gave a command to cross to the other side of the lake. So you, you, do you understand what that means? It, it, Jesus had given orders. He'd given the command to cross to the other side. He had given that word of authority, right? That's what we see there. And then if you look at uh, the first part of verse 28 of Matthew chapter 8, it says, when he arrived at the other side, the first part, when he had arrived at the other side of that region. So, Let's put this together. Yes, there was a storm in the middle, right? Between what I just read in verse 18 and verse 28. There's a storm. 
a violent storm, a fierce storm in the middle of all of that. Yes, absolutely. But we can still see, oh, very clearly, the will of God in Jesus Christ was accomplished. Jesus spoke the word of authority in verse 18, and in verse 28, it came to pass. Right? You tell me that that's not cool. <laughs> you tell me that's, that's wonderful. So, but then, you know, you might be saying, well, why the storm then? Right? Why the storm in the middle? Well, you know, the disciples had to learn the lesson. The disciples had to pass that test of faith. They had to believe God's word. They had to believe that where the word of the king is, there is power. They had to believe that Jesus has the authority and that Jesus has the backing of all of heaven so that when he says something, it'll come to pass. Even if all the external factors and the environment seem to say everything to the contrary. That's the lesson uh, that not only the disciples had to learn, it's the lesson that we have to learn ourselves. Right? And it's a test of faith that all of us want to pass. You know, to, to believe God's word and the power of Christ, no matter what, through hell or high water, to believe to believe in his word, the author of the word, to believe in him, to trust him at what he says, to believe he's in control, to believe that he has the power and that he is able. You know, now, it might very well be the case that you yourself are facing a, a storm from the enemy, a satanic storm, and maybe it's the case that you haven't believed in the Lord Jesus really sincerely and repented and, and been converted to that life of freedom, salvation. But, you know, it might be the case that you've taken those steps toward that, but there's been a storm which is hindering you. And, you know, or it's the other case where you've been a believer walking with the Lord for, for a while now, and, and you just feel like you are just being pounded. You feel like you're being assaulted by the powers of darkness, the winds and the waves as such. You know, well, friends, I want you to, and I want myself, all of us, to see the words of the king today, the king of kings. The first word was a word of strong rebuke to the storm, right? We see that. He speaks to the storm, and he commands it to be still, quiet, be still, as Mark put it, right, in his gospel. And so what we have to understand is the power of the king of kings to speak to whatever enemies in our lives. But, but more than that, I think he, he's actually delegated, and I talked a bit about this last week, He's actually delegated certain power and authority to us as Christians to speak to the enemy ourselves in our lives. And I really think that that's something that many of us as believers, maybe we've never practiced that. Maybe we've never practiced that. I want to take you to the Gospel of Luke quick. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And in Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. You know, those snakes and scorpions are a picture. They're an emblem of the enemy and demonic forces. Right? So the question comes to us, how many snakes and scorpions have you and I crushed, trampled in this last week, in this last month, in this last year? How many? Right? You know, is that something that you and I do as believers on a regular basis? Well, friends, I, you know, listen, I can assure you of this. 
You know, whether you're aware of it or not, whether I'm aware of it or not, at times that these forces are coming against us and they might be coming against you, maybe even hurting you because you're not aware of the authority and the power that Jesus has given you over them. That Jesus has given all of us as believers over them. You know, in, a, in, in the last book uh, of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and, you know, we're very familiar uh, with these words, Revelation 12, 11, it says, now it says this probably, you know, looking into the future slightly, right? But uh, nevertheless, very relevant to the present. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And, you know, I think, I believe that that word of testimony, they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. They triumphed over the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. That word of their testimony entails what the word of God says the blood of Jesus Christ does for us. So they're not just putting their faith in something that Jesus did 2,000 years ago, but by their declaration and their confession of faith. They're, they're declaring what the word of God says the blood of Jesus does you know, and, and maybe this is often where we fall down, right? You know what I mean? Because we have some kind of, you know, it's okay. We, we, we go forward. We, we've got that conceptual belief, right? That's what we've got. But then we fail to appropriate it, you know, in, in more than a simple, quiet assurance in our hearts, you know? And then, you know, we, 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 there's some kind of a you know, th theoretical ascent, right? You know, but what we really need to do is actually take God's word and declare and proclaim what God says our victory over darkness is. You know, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Now, that emphasizes the necessity to preach and to speak the word of God, and it also indicates that God speaks uh, to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, if you were to read Galatians chapter 3, I'm not going to take the time to go there, but... What we read in Galatians 3 is that people are converted not at all by the works of the law, but by the hearing of faith is what we read there from the apostle. You know, and you know, there are miracles that are done in the midst of the Galatian Christians, not by the works of the law, but by the hearing of faith. But one of the Ways we can hear the word of God in in, in, a, in a way uh, in a manner that uh, bolsters and increases our faith is hearing ourselves, hearing ourselves declare and proclaim the word of God. Man, there's power in that verbal proclamation and declaration of Scripture. You know, when when we face a storm, here we are. You know, and, and we're just facing a storm that's coming against us, in particular from the enemy. We need to declare and proclaim the word of God. And, you know, it, it's like the psalmist. Psalm 42, uh, verse 5. In Psalm 42, what he's doing, he's speaking to himself. So, Psalm 42, verse 5. Listen to what the psalmist says to himself. Why, my soul... Are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, he says to himself. You know, he's not praying to God there. He's talking to his own soul, is what we have. And, and friends, we, we need to take 
what Jesus has purchased for us at the cross, and we need to appropriate it and to use, as the, as the Word of God says, we need to use our weapons of warfare that are strong, that are mighty through God, to that pulling down, that taking down of strongholds in our lives and actually in the lives of others, right? So the first word of Christ the King is a word of rebuke to the storm. And friends, he's giving you authority. He's giving you authority. And maybe, I don't know, maybe it's the case that you've just been uh, passive uh, in a battle and you're, and you're conscious that it's from the enemy. Listen, God is saying, I believe that he's really saying to you today that you just need to get up. You need to take these weapons and the armor that God's given you through the blood of Jesus, and you need to start declaring and proclaiming the victory that, he, that he's given you. But now the second word, I think, was gentler, and it was a word of rebuke to the disciples. Again, verse 26 of Matthew chapter 8, he said to them, You have a little faith. Why are you so afraid? You know, now, why did he rebuke them? Right? Because they feared. They failed the test. You know, they, they needed faith to pass that test. They should have believed the word of Christ that we had read back in verse 18. It, you know, that, that same word that he gave in uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Let us go over to the other side. All right? You know, we see here in Matthew chapter 8, verse 18, that he gave orders to cross over. Mark chapter 4, we see those words, let us go over to the other side, right? Those are the words of Christ. He gave a command, the order to depart to the other side. Jesus did not say, hey, let's make an attempt to get to the other side, right? He didn't say that. You know, this is a very emphatic statement. Let us go to the other side. We have the order. He gave the command. You know, and again, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So this was a very practical test of what they had heard. They heard that command. They had heard the order. You know, imagine for a moment if you and I were given a practical examination based on what we've heard over the years, right? Friends, this is the reason why God permits tests as such to come into our lives, because I say this as a teacher. It's not enough to learn lessons. We need to live lives. We need to have experience, right, in our lives. You know, so the Lord rebuked them, well, not only because they failed to believe the promise, but secondly, they, they failed to recognize the presence of the incarnate Christ there in the midst of the boat. They were in the same boat as the very Son of God. And you might say, well, yes, but he was asleep, the text tells us. He was asleep. Yes, he was. But he was there. Friends, don't miss that. He was asleep, yes, absolutely. But friends, he was there. He was there. It says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Don't miss that, friends. He got into the boat. His disciples followed him onto the boat. You know, in back in verse 18, he had spoken the word. They were following his bodily presence, and he was there with them. Friends, he is there with you. The word of God, he is there with you. He wants to get into your boat, it is the reality. And what I mean is he wants to be the captain. He wants to be Lord of your life. He wants to be in charge of your life. Uh, 
Um, now, of course, does any of this teach us that Christ will always uh, miraculously deliver us from all storms? Well, you know, it would be absolutely great if he did. Uh, but, you know, it, it doesn't. That's not what it teaches us. You know, he doesn't always miraculously deliver us from all these storms. We know that. And, uh, you know, uh, I would say maybe most of the time we could be very quickly delivered from, you know, from the satanic type of storm. But there are times when he allows and he even engages us in a particular storm for a purpose. You know, and, and there's a time period to it. I, you know... Um, as we, uh, you know, as we look in Scripture, you know, we see that there are storms that people were delivered out of, right? We see it time and again, like the disciples here. But um, if you were to read in, a, I think a good example is uh, is Acts uh, chapter twenty-seven. You have a, <laughs> there, you have a literal storm in Acts chapter twenty-seven, and we see, and we, and it, we, I bring this up because in that chapter you see Paul the apostle. Right? Paul, this is Paul. And he was of great faith. And in fact, he, he stood in the midst of a storm and he relayed there in Acts 27 how an angelic messenger from the Lord had given him the assurance that they would all live if they all obeyed what he was about to say. And he declared in verse 25 of Acts chapter 27. Acts 27, verse 25. I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. And it was as God had told him. But, but, he had to go through the storm. He had to go through a shipwreck. He had to go through it. Uh, Warren Worsby said the greatest danger was not the wind and the waves, but it was the unbelief in the disciples' hearts. He said, our, our greatest problems are within us, not around us. Friends, can we say that someday, even in these days? That our greatest problems are within us, not around us. Now, sometimes... God does save us from trouble, but other times he saves us in trouble. And sometimes he saves us from death, like uh, uh, Peter, who was uh, miraculously delivered from prison, remember, by those angelic messengers. And yet sometimes, and this is the hard one, he delivers us in death and uses our death for his glory, like uh, uh, like the Apostle James who was beheaded. That's hard, right? But, you know, friends, whether in life and death, you know, friends, we're in the same boat. We're in the same boat as Christ. If he gets in that boat, you know, follow him. You know, and that's what the disciples failed to recognize. They, they failed to engage their faith in the Word of God, and they failed to recognize their the presence of the incarnate God with them. And we can understand it because we do this. You know, he says to us today, really, the Spirit of God says to us today those, those words that we hear in Romans chapter 8, verses 36 through 39. For your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce, for getting us back on. Now, friends, uh, we went dark there. And I will tell you that I will tell you the truth. I was in the middle of saying I had just read Romans chapter 8, verses 36 through 39. And I had said that Jesus has authority over disease. I had said that Jesus has authority over death. And friends, the screen went black as I was about to say that Jesus has authority over demonic powers. Now, I have no idea what, 
<laughs> we couldn't figure out what caused the screen to go black at that moment. But, you know, perhaps the enemy is trying to disrupt. I won't be dogmatic about it. I have no idea what caused that. But friends, listen. Jesus has authority over natural. Jesus has authority over supernatural. But I, will, I do want to share this with you, friends. We're almost finished. Jesus has also authority over fear. You know, victory doesn't come to us through accommodating fear. It comes from conquering it in faith. It, it, you know, it, it's actually in the presence of fear that faith there breaks through. God asks us to believe in his word and believe that he's with us. Now, even if there's a satanic assault that comes upon us, he asks us to believe. And yes, we're, we're, we're to put on our, our armor and we're to take all our authority and we are to proclaim and we are to declare everything that we possibly can. But we are to choose to believe his promises and choose to believe that his presence is with us. And if we don't break out of the storm, we will break through the storm. Living or dead, but we'll break through. Hopefully living. <laughs> but we don't know what God has for us. But what he doesn't want us to be, friends, I believe, is in fear uh, of the storm. You know, Jesus is the master of every situation. And he is the conqueror of every enemy. And if we trust in him, and if we follow his orders, friends, then you and I need never be afraid. Let's go to the Lord as we close this morning. Lord, uh, we uh, thank you uh, for your uh, wonderful word to our hearts today. And uh, there, Lord, we know these storms uh, come into our lives, and at times the, the enemy is behind it. He can do nothing without your permission. And so there are times when the enemy is permitted uh, to go ahead and to do that, to disrupt our lives in such a way. And uh, we have to trust in you that you're still with us. We have to go through certain things, certain troubles, and, and so forth in order that faith might break through. And so, uh, Lord, help us to be a people who do that, who continue to trust in you, no matter the disaster and the calamity around us. You know, sometimes, Lord, we just need to understand that the greatest problems are within us. The greatest turmoil is within us. And that's what needs to be settled. That's what needs to be calmed. We need to understand, Lord, that there are times when you will certainly deliver us from the storm. We need to understand, Lord, help us understand that there are times where we must go through. But help us, Lord, in the midst of all of it, to remember that you are good. It is a goodness that has always been it is a goodness that always will be, and it is a goodness that is present with us now. I pray, Lord, that uh, we'll know this, we will hold it dear to our hearts as we go forth in these days. Be with each and all of these dear ones as they go through circumstances that surround them. And that perhaps they are at this very moment rather disastrous, I don't know. whatever the circumstance, Lord, that, that you're with them and you will see them through. Lord, uh, uh, help us not to fall into the trap of believing that you're weak or that you've forgotten us. Such is not the case. You are far greater than the enemy. No one and nothing matches your strength and your power, and you have the word, the word of authority, the word of power, 
that word of healing, with just a word, that word you speak, things start to happen. Things happen. Now, Lord, we want to be a part of whatever happens. <laughs> help us to help us to recognize you there with us. I pray um, in Jesus' name. Amen.